and Formation. Uh, this webinar is basically about pharmacy business continuity post COVID-19, and I'll tell you why we came up with such a topic for this particular season. Uh, before we continue, I would like to uh, just uh, reiterate some housekeeping rules. Uh, make sure that your mic is muted so that we do not get feedback on the background. Uh, make sure you turn off your video to avoid any um, distractions, uh, but also to save on your bandwidth. Uh, please ask questions using the chat room or the question and answer room. We'll be definitely, uh, we'll definitely be happy to answer all your questions. Uh, this recording will be on YouTube, so please follow our, subscribe to our YouTube channel, the PSU YouTube channel, and make sure at the end of this webinar, uh, you fill in the feedback form. Please give us candid feedback on what you liked, things that we should improve. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, my name is Stella Kivila. I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm a pharmacist by training. I love healthcare. I love making sure that people get well. I love interacting with clients. I am also a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda. I'm a member of the PSU Education Committee as, as well. And I'm a founder and lead coach of Performance Point International, a company that helps organizations build high performance teams. Now, we all know that in Uganda and also Sub-Saharan Africa, the first point of contact of a patient with a healthcare worker always happens at the pharmacy. The reason is that we have either a broken healthcare system, we have lack of national health insurance schemes, and therefore that forces people to spend out of pocket when it comes to healthcare. So today we really want to deep dive onto different uh, perspectives uh, of business because community pharmacies, which are majorly run from, a pri from the private sector, are, 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 are these points of contact. And so what we want to unearth is what has changed in the current and in the current situation of the COVID pandemic, but also we also want to understand what will happen next, how will we access healthcare? And, and, and we'll look at three major pillars of, 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 of pharmacy business. And we'll look at supply chain, we'll look at the consumer trends, and we will also look at human resource trends. So please post your questions as we go along. With us, we have a strong, uh, we have a strong uh, team of panelists, what I'll call the giants in the, in the pharmaceutical sector. And I will start uh, with uh, Anthony Natif. Anthony Natif is also a pharmacist. He's also a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda. He's an oncology pharmacist, a pharmacist specialized in cancer treatment. He received his training at Dana Farber Harvard Center in Boston at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, where he did a fellowship in HIV associated malignancies. He got his pharmacy degree at Macquarie University, and he also has a master's in public health, leadership, policy, and management from the University of Washington, amongst other training. He has worked in Uganda as a head of cancer pharmacy services, as well head of finance and administration at the Uganda Cancer Institute. He started the current Uganda Cancer Institute Pharmacy, as well as a private patient service and co-wrote the essential drug list for cancer in Uganda. His efforts at the Institute saw the growth of the medicine budget from just 50 million Ugandan shillings, which is actually not enough even for one week, to more than 2 million USDs in just 18 months. He has since left and has ventured into the private sector where he founded Guardian Health, chain of pharmacies with initial capital of 50,000 USD back in November, 2012. This company right now is valued at $10 million and recently successfully raised $3 million and aims to be the go-to pharmacy in the East African region. For you to get more information about Guardian Pharmacy, you can visit their website, but also you can visit their physical locations at Kabalagala, Kansanga, Bunga, Munyonyo, Wandegia, Kisementi, Chitintale, Ntinda, Jinja, and Barara. And I'm very well aware that they have three more coming up in the next few weeks. You are so welcome, Anthony Natif. 
All right. So we have Thanks our so second. I appreciate that. Most welcome, Natif. All right. So we have our second panelist, uh, Mr. Patrick Sendagire. Mr. Patrick Sendagire is what we call a serial entrepreneur. He is the CEO and founder of Lisa Pharmaceuticals Limited. He is a current chairman, board of directors at Guild Frank Forex Bureau. And he's also an MD and co-founder of Priceline Forex Bureau Limited. He's an entrepreneur with 10 years in business leadership, experience in all aspects of business formation, operation, finance, and management. A relentless optimist who is a strong proponent of an open and market-driven economy. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Quantitative Economics from the Macquarie University. If you want to get more information about Lisa Pharmacy, please go and visit them in, on their website and also social media. And you can go to their branches in Tinder, Kamocha, Mukwano Arcade, and Kabalagala. You are so welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Stella. All right, and then we have our third panelist in the house as well, Mr. Ed Iwumbwe. Uh, Mr. Ed Iwumbwe is also a pharmacist and also a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda. He is the founder and chief executive officer of Ecofarm Limited, the largest retail pharmacy chain in Uganda, operating 15 outlets in and around Kampala. Ed is a proud recipient of various awards from the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda, including Community Pharmacist of the Year Award, Pharmacist Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, and many others. Ed is an alumni of Macquarie University, where he did his Bachelor of Pharmacy, but also has graduated from the States. Uh, meeting very many people, it was always going to cause uh, discomfort. And so I might, you know, are facing discomfort because if you have to put on masks for a long time, all the time you are in many people, you have to sanitize every 20 seconds. Is it? It's really a whole lot of discomfort. So that is it on personal level. Maybe the positive side about it was that I was able to get an unusual father in a particular world, but then woke up in a completely different world. That's all I can describe it personal and, and professionally. Thank you, Stella. Okay, thank you so much, Patrick. I see your family is enjoying you being at home much more. Sure. Uh, Natif, are you back? Natif, can you hear me now? All right, so he will join us a bit later. All right, uh, so let's just take a deep dive to the center. Pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, nurses, and, and so many others. So with the advent of social distances and digitization, are there any changes we need to make in bringing the next generation of healthcare workers? Uh, and what values will pharmacies bring post-COVID? Uh, Patrick, would you like to take that? This could spread. So, um, in terms of uh, That is social distancing, but also we had elements we had to learn, as I said, of um, the digitalization. And when you ask me what other, how, what changes should take place, maybe what should we ask for post-COVID of human resource? As, and I think maybe digital skills would have to come in because as Stella, you know, this is not the first pandemic and uh, our viewers out there, it's not the first pandemic and it's not the last one. That means we have to prepare 
that if, even if we go through this one, there is another one to come. What, shall we be more ready for it? And our and understanding on how it will come through. So for the moment, I think I'll, I'll just I'll stop there for a moment. Maybe I've seen it come through. Uh, they may have something to add. Okay, thank you so much, Patrick, for those insights. I mean, if you have to adhere to the Ministry of Health guidelines, how do you change the pharmacy setting? Uh, do you reduce the number? You know, do we have to go digital? Thank you so much for that. Uh, I will ask uh, maybe Eid and, and Anthony to comment on the same from a human resource perspective. Um, I will have Eid go first. Eid? Eid, you're muted. Thank you very much, Stella. And uh, good afternoon to everyone listening to us. To, to share our experience very well that all over the world, pharmacy convention. Is a 24-hour service up to 10 o'clock and at most midnight for a few of the pharmacies that you have seen. Now, when the regular curfew, for example, what does that mean? It means that the workers must leave work at five. It also means that the human resource that we have been employed needed, they are essential, but they are not needed because you cannot deploy them, all of them, in, especially when you want social distance. So you have the situation of curfew and you have an essential service. And uh, I can it asking whether the pharmacy is open and the answer the pharmacy is closed. And literally patients drop the call crying. I have personal experience, not one, not two, but crying. The baby needs a syrup. He has a prescription in his hands, but he cannot access. So this is the scenario we are dealing with from a human resource. And also, I mentioned the fact that we no longer can accommodate all the staff that are employed with us and, and many other implications, as, uh, as Patrick already highlighted. So, now, if, if, if of course, we have to jump around having some support on and on, so that, that's what I can share for now from a, a, an HR perspective. Interesting, interesting perspective the working hours. So, whilst other businesses are closing at 3 p.m., the question is, uh, will the pharmacies be allowed to close at, at 3 p.m., you know, and uh, what's the implication of that? You know? And then do we even have jobs, you know, if at all we can't have redundancy in the human resource perspective? Natif, what has your experience from a human resource perspective been? Natif? Natif. All right. Uh, okay. So it. I was. I was. I, I. I had asked Patrick earlier, but I'd like to get your thoughts on how COVID has really impacted your personal, professional, and business life. Well, Stella, these have been three months of what we called accelerated stability testing. You know what I mean? That, that you want to test the resilience of your systems, your own resilience, the resilience of your staff, the resilience of, of, your, your, of, of, of the country as a whole in terms of pharmaceutical supply. And these are three months only. And you can see that we have drugs that are being depleted from the shelves and we, can, we cannot get a replacement. 
And if this goes on and on to phase three, you are aware that we are in phase three. Of, if this goes on to phase four of the pandemic, where you have uh, people dying and going to specialized facilities, and then you are run, you've run out of supplies, and that's what's happening in other countries. Now, professionally, we have been tested. Do we have enough drug supplies? Can we move fast enough? Do we have enough contacts with our suppliers? Because this is a time when suppliers are selective and say, we have very little, we cannot give you. So have you established enough relationship with your supplier to give priority to your pharmacy? And so on and so forth. So I have seen this as a big test to how relevant we are, first and foremost, because out of so many pharmacies you see in the country, this is a time when only few can remain relevant. In terms of, I want my medication, the other pharmacy has the supply, the other pharmacy has run out. So how relevant are you in your community? And this is going to test moving forward after COVID. You're going to see that some pharmacies are going to be more relevant than others because they have not been resilient during this period. Run out of supplies, run out of everything, run out of this. And you have seen so many changes, suppliers asking for upfront payment, mm. which has not been happening before. Yeah. And what does this mean to opening pharmacies right now? You know that we have known pharmacy business as you can get credit, but the pharmacy, because of, of the supply chain interruptions. So what does this mean for the next one year? Shall we be seeing new pharmacies? Maybe not many. Some pharmacies close. Yes, I, I think we will be seeing them. So this has tested us which pharmacy will live beyond this. What is the shelf life? The way you do an understand these hard conditions. Uh, this is what we do. Wow, interesting stress testing. So our tests on our resilience, on our relevance in the market, even from a personal perspective, what do we really bring to the table? All right, thank you so much, Ed. And let me just continue this conversation with Ed. Uh, we know that, um, that, 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 yes, you've talked about pharmacies being open, You've talked also about, you know, uh, are we like any other business, the implication of human risk? I want you to touch on to the consumer side of it. Have you seen any shifts in the consumer trend? It? Happening. Yes, Stella. Yes, have you seen any consumer trends shifting? Uh, maybe you can you can you can help us throw more light on what was there before and what is currently happening inside the pharmacy. What are consumers saying? What do consumers say? What are the shifts in the consumer? Uh, that's for me still again. So I was yes. saying I, I wanted you to throw more light. I wanted you yes. to throw more, more light on. The the consumer trends. Uh, have you seen any shifts in terms of the customer needs, in terms of the customer wants, in terms of different categories, even in the pharmacies? What have you experienced in this season? What I've seen is uh, for starters, consumers will always look for what they have always looked for. But the issue is what going to change. What needs from wants to needs, if I may say, from wants to needs. You want all this, but you need this. Because we are going to see that most consumers have less money in their pockets. That is for sure. They have less money in their pockets. So the priority list is going to change from wants to needs. So what we are seeing is the chronic care medications, the need for chronic care has not reduced. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I think uh, we lost it temporarily. Okay. So, Natif, would you like to just jump in and give us insights, perspective? Oh, well, um, I think what he was going to is trust, be honest. Okay, Id, Id, are you back? Are you back? Yes, I'm back. Wonderful. Okay, so we'll continue with you and then Natif will just chip in a bit. Yes. Okay, so, so you are at chronic medication, so you've seen, you've seen no change in the demand of chronic medication? Yes, because these are on the needs list. Now on the ones list, the need for personal care for cosmetics is going to change. And the reason I gave you is people have less money in their pockets. Frankly speaking, these are the trends that we are seeing in terms of the consumer. But also, I see that the consumer is going to, to be looking for pharmacies that have been of help during this time. So I see that it's going to have an impact moving forward because people have tested and some pharmacies have run out of stock. During this period. Now, pharmacies that have resisted this are likely to do better business. But also, I see many things on the market that are, will affect the consumer directly. For example, availability of certain products. We have products that may not be here for a couple of months. We also are going to see uh, some pharmacies not accessing stock because of different reasons. Uh, financial capacity uh, and many things, projections. So there are many things that are going to affect the consumer from all those levels. Okay. Uh, if you can add something. Okay. Thank you so much for throwing in uh, that 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 interesting insight about uh, whilst you may be fulfilling some customer needs, there are still the, uh, some that are pending based on or issues with the supply chain. Uh, Natif, you wanted to chip in onto the consumer trends? Yes. Um, uh, Ed mentions a very important point about uh, NCDs. Um, of course, as we get into this panic mode and uh, scramble the jets to try and contain uh, COVID-19, we have to remain cognizant of the fact that NCDs are the largest killers of humans in the world to the extent of uh, killing more than 33% of the world's population. So uh, quite unfortunately, and I know later in the, in the conversation, we're gonna have uh, a section devoted to uh, People are in their houses locked up with malignant hypertension with uh, diabetes, uh, runaway diabetes, with uh, CVD, with cancer. And I know very well that the Cancer Institute tried to do something for their existing patients where they had to give them passes so that they could access care. But then what happens to the ones that uh, could not, well, didn't know in the first place that they had cancer. So you will see very little growth, if any, in the number of people who require NCD medications. Not because the diseases have suddenly disappeared, but because access to a healthcare provider is down. And as you know, uh, the whole uh, cycle of access is just beyond the ability of the drug on the shelf. It uh, uh, encompasses uh, access to good information, access to prescriber, uh, 
these healthcare facilities. Now for us pharmacies, uh, we think that uh, we can say, well, the community is, uh, is able to access a pharmacy if people live within five kilometers. During this COVID period and the lockdowns, when we don't have uh, public transport, uh, certainly that distance then becomes longer. My 80 year old dad may not be able to walk five kilometers to a pharmacy. So, then what happens if he lives by himself and he needs medication? So, access in that case is going to be negatively impacted. And uh, I think uh, we at Guardian, and by the look of things at Ecofarm, will certainly see uh, reduction in growth of those numbers. Uh, I think that's that's all I could add to that. Wow, now. thank you. Thank you so much, Natif. Very interesting perspectives, especially when it comes to NCDs and non-communicable diseases, and we are talking about diabetes, hypertension, um, cancer, and, and I am seeing uh, Mr. Odoi uh, pointing out in the chat room, and he has been able to give us a link, and he has said it contributes to 71% of death. And so whilst we will That's see a steady... Point, but uh, I think this is not a forum for fact-checking. <laughs> Okay, it's still significant regardless of the of the of the figures, yeah, the facts the and figures. Yeah. No, no problem. The burden of disease is definitely high. And so the question would be how do we also improve the diagnosis, uh, especially when we have limited access to the to the first point of contact with a healthcare worker, which happens to be at the pharmacy. I do not know what Patrick's experience has been in regardless in in regards to the to the perspective. Patrick, would you like to chip in? Patrick? All right. So we'll uh, have Patrick. Do you, want me to, do you want me to talk about improvement in diagnosis? Okay, maybe you can just uh, very, very shortly, short and sharp, uh, maybe you can just perhaps quickly chip in. Yes. You know, sometimes you have uh, realize that it's important that we don't waste uh, a, 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 we utilize a bad opportunity never waste um, any opportunity however good or bad uh, this covid situation has shown a light on the importance of things like telemedicine and telepharmacy and um, uh, there's been uh, righteous noise made around uh, those industries so uh, remote doctors uh, are growing in demand we are suddenly realizing that maybe uh, I don't have to walk into a doctor's office. I can have my doctor over the internet. I can have my doctor on the telephone. And I think that's a good thing that uh, we need to embrace. And uh, the pharmaceutical society is leading this fight to kind of um, revolution. We view community pharmacy and uh, take it um, online and uh, to some simple of our practice and make it remote. And I think we'll get there. We'll still some teaching pains, but we certainly will get there. Okay, fantastic. So remote working actually space and in the healthcare space as well. Um, and so let's just deeply dive in into an important aspect of ensuring that we are having the right commodities behind the shelf. And then this is to touch on supply chain. Now, we know that how has this pandemic affected the importation of medicine into the country? So Natif, I'd like you to address that and maybe help us look at before what used to happen and now what's happening now that the borders are closed and we have heavily depended on importation for branded medicine. Whoa. Uh, thanks, Stella. Um, uh, step back, you have to realize that uh, Uganda imports more than 90%. Uh, Patrick, do you want to mute your mic, please? Ah, thanks. Is it fine? 
Uh, Anthony, is it fine? Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, I just wanted you to mute your mic because I was getting some feedback. It's uh, muted it, now, uh, thank you. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, yeah, so we import 90% of our medicine and that's awful because what that means is um, when you try and understand the cycle of how medicine ends up in the hands of the consumer, who makes the it's gotten by the money bought, so you the product. And then the way we are set up in Uganda is that each of those manufacturers has a local technical representative here who basically has monopoly over that product. So then if this local technical representative doesn't they are, they are having a disagreement with um, uh, their distributors here, it could be anything. So if they don't have a product, that means we'll not have that product. So pre-COVID, uh, we had like 80% of our orders being filled locally, and then we had to figure out ways of importing the 20%. Um, and I don't know the split with Ed or Patrick, but oftentimes for pharmacies like at our level, it's usually along the same lines. But now, post-COVID, because of these uh, difficulties in the logistical handling of things and uh, uh, other issues that I'm going to get into, you find that if we send our orders to a local distributor, we're going to get back only 40% of our requirements. And then you get back that 40% with prices that are jacked up. Uh, we view, uh, like I've told you guys previously, we view uh, pharmacy business not just as a way of uh, getting rich quick. We, 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 we look at it as a social service. So it's extremely painful to see us jacking up prices. But then when you look back and see that uh, say in March, because these guys have to import medicines and they usually buy that medicine in dollars, you have to figure out things like uh, the dollar rate, I mean the, the forex rate fluctuations. I'll give you an example. In January, the dollar was just under 3,600. Uh, between March and April, the dollar was 3,950. Now the dollar trades at around 3,800. That's a 15% swing. Now with that 15% swing within just three months, it means the price is going to go up naturally from the loss of forests. Then these guys do not have enough stock. So lots of people who may not view pharmacy as a, I mean, as a, as a, as a force for good, but instead view it as some get rich quick scheme, they will think, look, I probably have 10,000 pieces of hydroxychloroquine and I know that it's in demand and uh, the, guy, the guy who is supposed to supply it to me says, well, he has a blockade on export of this product. So what this guy is going to do is he's going to jack up the price like five times. Uh, we saw that with hydroxychloroquine, we used to sell a tablet for maybe 1,500 shillings a tub. Now, um, well, until fairly recently, maybe two weeks ago, um, that tablet was going for between 10 to 15,000 shillings. And remember that we already said that the number of people who have been uh, diagnosed with uh, NCDs is not going down. So this guy with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, this guy with lupus, he's still gonna want his medicine. And he's suddenly coming in and finding the drug at 10 times the price. It's so hard for you to look that person in the eye and tell them that price. So as uh, community pharmacists who also care about perception, you have to kind of reach this decision of, should I stock the product and somehow uh, have my pharmacists and dispensers and what bear the brunt of a pistol client? Or should I just explain to that client that you know what, um, this product may be out of range. So it's a terrible balancing act. I don't know how these guys, uh, my colleagues have dealt with it. Uh, then you have um, issues like previously, we used to finance our businesses. Well, it's fundamentally three ways. 
you have the bank, you have uh, external financing, say equity investment, uh, or you, your shareholder money, or you probably have supplier money. Uh, how you have supplier money is by talking about inventory days. So basically I go to my supplier and say, look, I have a turnaround time of inventory of say 30 days. So can I pay you in 60 days? And that allows us to uh, be able to sell products cheaply because the cost of financing is being borne by the supplier. But then with COVID, uh, those terms have changed for many people. So they have to get back to cash payments. And many businesses do not have a treasure trove of cash to sink into inventory. You mentioned SKUs. I don't know if uh, uh, all our viewers understand what SKUs are, but I'll tell you this is the, basically the distinct type of item that we hold. It's the smallest uh, representation of our inventory. Say, I should be able to define my inventory from, you know, I have this product, it's manufactured by this person, it's batch number is this, it's expiry date is this, that's an SKU. Now we hold anywhere between 3,000 to 6,000 SKUs. And uh, you find we may have like 50 suppliers or more. There's lots of them that aggregate. And then there's individual suppliers like say Eid, like me who will have a few items here and there, Patrick. You know, you have like 5,000 of those guys. I mean, um, 50 of those suppliers. So then you have to make sure you have all your supplier contracts nicely negotiated because when they come back and say, look, I'm struggling to access this entry. My freight costs are higher, which they are. You're getting a product that we used to get, say, from the UK for 2,000 pounds shipment. Suddenly it goes to 8,000 pounds. So then we'll have to scramble for cash to be able to cover that. We'll have to scramble for cash to be able to pay our suppliers. And then that chain breaks. Because it's unsustainable, you have to find these 4,000, 5,000 SKUs. You have to find money for them during this period. And it's extremely difficult. And it hasn't been helped by the fact that for the last three months, banking uh, is almost dead. Bankers have zero appetite for risk, even when you've been dealing with them for the longest time. I may not be experiencing that problem, thank God, but I don't know for how much longer. I listen to colleagues in the industry who are crying. A lot of them are seeing their businesses fold because of this problem. So it's, uh, it's absolutely awful to see, but well, you have to weather the storm. Um, Basically, that's it. It's, 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 I don't know what the rest of the panelists will look at, but yeah, uh, supply chain has been heavily disrupted. We have to think about ways of banding together as uh, pharmaceutical services providers and uh, find a way of, um, you know, having each other's backs and uh, maybe group ordering to bring down prices, maybe unionizing to push back on... Um, run away prices from suppliers and bear in mind that we are running a free market economy. So National Drug Authority doesn't seem to think that it's a good idea to regulate price. And quite frankly, you also can't blame them. It's not largely their mandate because we are in a free market economy. So who takes the brunt of those bad prices? It's, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the consumer and it's, it's, it's sad because we are not dealing in items of luxury, we are dealing in items that uh, uh, pertain to matters of life and death. If my old man doesn't have his product, maybe he may not live to see another day. If the price of medication for malaria is way through the roof, I don't know how many people are gonna die during that process. So we later probably in this, in this, in this conversation, we'll have to look at uh, solutions for that and see how we can address it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Natif, for fleshing out all those insights. Uh, what I've heard you saying is really, you know, what I liked that you said about using pharmacy as a force for good social justice. Where do you draw the line in the sand and say, we will be here for good 
instead of capitalizing on the opportunity of escalating prices. And so, um, and so at the end of the day, you find the final consumer is the person who actually suffers the most when the supply chain is broken as it is right now. And uh, before we go into the question and answer session, I'm seeing very many people asking questions. Keep your questions coming. We've gone into our question and answer segment as, we, as it were. Id, what have you experienced in the supply chain? Uh, thank you, Stella. And you know that uh, I'm also an important wholesaler. So the reality is many steps in the supply chain uh, have become more difficult. You've, you know that very many countries right now have limited flights. Countries like Cyprus, uh, even in many actually countries from Europe have very limited cargo flights. So because of that, you find even emergency drugs, you have to choose, shall you wait until the flight is available or you'll opt for C flight and then you go for C. And when you go for C, you take another one month to Mombasa and then from Mombasa, the truck driver joins the queue. So when you look at a drug you were going to get in two weeks and now you get in two months, realistically speaking, the price is not going to be the same. Now, on the other hand, as a retailer, we have been put into this scenario of how do you manage price stability in this very unstable environment? And honestly speaking, we have lost money in the process. You buy this item at this price, you go back, the price has gone up. So essentially, the money you have gained from this first process, you are unable to replace that stock but you are the person facing the patient and the patient is saying, you're very expensive. So this has happened. And in this phase, remember the panic buying that happened. Many people did turnover, but without profit. You do very high sales, but each time you sell, you are unable to replace the stock because the prices are changing and they are changing for the real genuine reasons. So these are the supply chain issues and uh, the importers are also dealing with us differently. For example, they will say you have to purchase in bulk, otherwise we shall not work with you. You have to purchase in bulk. The issues of minimum order quantities are coming. The issues of uh, minimum value are coming in. You find the supplier saying I'll not work with you unless the order is 10,000. So these are the dynamics that are going to eventually to affect the prices. Thank you. Interesting, interesting. And thank you so much for looking at it from, two, uh, from a, a, a two-pronged perspective of an importer, but also as a retailer. And so this begs the question of one of the, of, 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 of the solutions. And I know Natif uh, bounced off a suggestion coming together to be able to negotiate better and be able to mitigate the risk. But I have Jimmy Chisache here asking Mr. Anthony Natif, do you think it is a wise move to support traditional medicines such as herbal medicines available on the market now? The supply for generic and branded medicines is scarce. Natif? Yeah, um, interesting question. Uh, I learned that, uh, uh, however, but the situation gets the lion never eats grass. Uh, what that will <laughs> fundamentally mean is we shouldn't throw away science and uh, the scientific process of robust testing of medication out of desperacy. And what I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that traditional medicines on the market do not work. Uh, I will tell you anecdotally, I believe certain herbs work. I was raised by my grandmother and there were times I would be running a fever or I get a wound somewhere and then she pounds a few leaves here and there and voila, I seem to be fine. But then can I tell you sure um, and how it affects me as an individual? The answer is I cannot. 
So we think that whereas we have uh, made strides, especially again led by the Komasko Society of Uganda and its president, uh, a one Dr. Patrick Ogwang, in terms of doing research in alternative medications, we need to do more in terms of uh, going through the scientific process of proving these products actually work. Whereas um, they may not lend themselves very nicely to the, the traditional clinical trials that we are used to, there has to be a way of testing this product. I and Ed and Patrick and many other people who care about our professional standards and care about our clients do not want to just rush and get a product whose um, uh, effectiveness we cannot vouch for and stick that product on, on the shelf, then we won't be much different than snake oil salesmen. I do not want to sell to my clients or anyone who comes into Guardian for that matter, any product that I cannot sell to my daughter or that I cannot sell to my best friend or I cannot sell to my brother or sister. So until we, and until we can speak as to the effectiveness and safety of these products, we will not stock a lot of them. And also you need to understand, there are people who are on chronic medications, uh, people who are on HIV medications, some cancer products. These products interact with these traditional medicines in ways that we cannot absolutely uh, properly explain. So you give someone a product that you genuinely know from your heart of heart works, but you have no science to back it up. And then they are on some strange uh, anti-HIV combination. And then before you know it, they're getting liver failure. So mm. it can be uh, a disservice to the community. And we kind of try and not rush into that. That mm. having been said, we have some traditional OTC products that we think work and they do less harm because they are not largely ingested in, um, into the body. So we try, once we, we, we read about the contents, we get into the literature and see these plants do X, Y, Z, then we stock those products. And also we keep the manufacturers informed, we keep uh, the regulator informed as to uh, the performance of that product, both from uh, uh, an effectiveness perspective, but also from um, the perspective of um, um, toxicity. Okay. So it's important. And uh, thankfully, the, the guys on this call care about professionalism. And I've certainly walked into Ecofarm, I've walked into Lisa, and I've seen the kind of person card that they have behind the counter. They do understand a lot of these medications, and they should be able to judge what uh, they can give to the client and what they can't. But we mm. won't panic into, we won't be forced into uh, somehow becoming snake oil salesmen. We are scientists first. <laughs> yes. We swear an oath to protect the health of uh, the society. Uh, if we are going to make some money for our shareholders and for ourselves while at it, well and good. But the most important thing is our professionalism and uh, service to the society. And we won't do a disservice to people just because they are demanding for Budomola or God knows what. Okay, thank you so much, Natif. We all uh, saw uh, in the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, all right? So health yeah. and safety first. Uh, so let's go to some questions that tackle the consumer. And this is to eat. I have Yona Tumwine asking, uh, so what has what is your solution, especially now that you have low volume of clientele and also low purchasing power? But I'll also uh, bundle it up with a different question uh, from Abel Omon Abedi Omondi, who says, so what are we going to do to contain uh, the abuse of opioids, especially amongst the youth? Uh, that has had an impact on mental health. And I, I can just imagine now in lockdown, there's a lot of possibility of a lot of drug abuse. And I think we've all seen it in our pharmacies. Codeine syrups. Yeah, Stella. At Ecofarm, our operate policy has always been the same and it will be. Pre-COVID, during COVID and post-COVID, 
And what we're talking about is a proper handling of opioids or controlled drugs. So we have our procedure laid out, we have followed it, we shall continue following it. And that is something that we believe is our contributions, is one of our contributions to proper pharmacy practice in terms of us not being a reason for escalating the already bad problem. So we will continue following our SOP. It's not going to be possible for you to access codeine at an echo farm counter that easily. We go as far as verifying and calling the doctor who has prescribed and we have the lists and signatures and everything. So it's not very easy to access these kind of drugs and uh, it will not be easy. Now, regarding the other question, what are we going to do with the reduced turnover? I think as a business, this is the time to reflect on how we can still remain profitable, even with less sales. And that is going to touch on being efficient at different points. So this is going to be a cycle. We have already done it. We now are looking at how to remain profitable, even with reduced sales. And that's really about being efficient, supply chain, negotiations with suppliers, um, and, and selling right, and also ensuring that our systems will reduce some expenses that we can reduce. So this is the time to remain afloat. It's not going to be profits this year, as many people have said, it's not going to be profits, but survival. Yes. Jack Mastile. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Ed, for that. Uh, so Stella, keep, can I keep... come in on, 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 on yes. the question of steroids, please? Yes, please. Opioids, yes. No problem. I mean, opioids, yes. I, I, like, I like the way Ed answered this. Uh, just because we want to make money does not mean that we should divorce our professionalism. The law is clear on how uh, you dispense these controlled items. And unfortunately, uh, the first law that people obey here is the law of money. I will tell you for sure that person who asked that question knows and they've done their research and they know that if they walk down on William Street with uh, say 5 million shillings and put it on the pharmacy of a pharmacy counter, they will walk away with all the codeine syrup uh, that that money can buy. Uh, this speaks to one, lax regulation. This speaks to lack of professionalism from the ownership of those pharmacies. This speaks to basically moral decadence. And unfortunately, there's not many rehab services. Uh, services aimed towards harm reduction, services aimed towards uh, substituting these opioids with uh, less harmful items. We have Butavica, but of late I've been paying attention to this problem and, you know, they can only do too much, uh, so much they're overwhelmed. So as the first dose um, that people who are looking for these products come knock on, we need to be careful to enforce because we are the regulator's eyes and ears behind the counter, we need to be careful to enforce uh, the law in as far as uh, dispensing of these controlled items is concerned. Uh, it talked about uh, prescriptions, insisting on prescriptions. Unfortunately, we saw this in Kavalagalai. We have our first stores in Kavalagalai still is. Uh, there's a ton of people who work with doctors. Uh, so one time there was a KCCA doctor who was, specialty seem to be writing prescriptions for steroids, I mean for opioids, and you know these are legitimate prescriptions, so client shows up with, you know, person wants in a supply of like a year, and they have a genuine prescription, so how do you deal with that? It's, uh, it, 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 we had to uh, fire a few of our staff for actually uh, respecting and serving a valid prescription. <laughs> Because it didn't make sense that, you know, you come in and you want individual and you want 20 syrups of Benilin codeine. Uh, there's this mm -hmm. other product made locally, Recodine, and, you know, a Nigerian kid comes in and he wants five cartons. 
to take to his dorm at KIU. So what do you do with that? So you have to uh, come down hard on the people you work with, your colleagues and the pharmacists, make sure there is proper uh, controlled drug dispensing records. National Drug Authority thankfully has availed these books. So anyone who has a controlled drug prescription has it recorded in that book. And then you can later on, in fact, you're supposed to furnish the regulator with these records, but I'll tell you not many <laughs> pharmacies do this. Uh, a pharmacy will sell 100 million worth of um, uh, an opioid and that will never register in the, in the regulator's database. Mm. And that's sad, mm. but I think it's a process that we need to consciously embrace mm -hmm. and keep checking and keep improving and then see how, how far that takes us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natif. COVID or no COVID, we still remain uh, pharmacists and we put human lives before money. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So let's go to a dicey topic. So we talked about the whole economics of the world. We've all talked about the whole economics of pharmacy business. Let's get to now our pockets, individual pockets. So that's a human resource question. Oliver could she's asking from a human resource perspective have you, how have you handled your employees in this period is it necessary or right for you to lay um, off people because of the pandemic and uh, closely followed by this question by maria louise and she says how are you really um, dealing with um, employee redundancy what's 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 your take on that uh, since lockdown began some people have not yet received salary so it, I'd like you to tackle that question. Thank you, Stella. Of course, uh, you know very well that uh, the pharmacy business has many pillars of key stakeholders. There is the stock, you must have the stock because that's what we are set out to provide. But just next to it is the staff. So the issues have been around all over the world. If you have the right stock, you make money. If you have the right staff, they will sell even the wrong stock, the wrong stock. But we believe at Ecofarm that we need our staff more than anything else. So during this period, we have intensified our communication with them and uh, direct communication, not through memos that you might see from other companies, but directly we have talked to each individual person and say, you see the situation we have in the country uh, you have been you working during an evening shift, which is not there. So you have to sit home during this period. And we hope that this will open up sooner or later. But of course, as the president guides, the scientists are advising appropriately how we can control this. And it's in our interest, actually, that we manage this, this pandemic, the way we are managing, so that we don't get to a dangerous stage four, which we all know. Mm. So having said that, right now we are engaging actively with our staff and trying to rotate them so that they are not so redundant. Rotate them so some are seated for a couple of weeks, some can come back and we need them because we believe that we shall be with them beyond this pandemic. So that's how we have managed. And uh, we believe that uh, we, we, we are in very good terms with our staff so far. We hope that uh, it will remain manageable. We hope, we really okay. hope. Okay, thank you so much, Ed, uh, for emphasizing that it's all about all of us understanding the situation and keeping the communications lines open. At this particular juncture, I'd like to kindly request our audience to stay with us for just an additional few more minutes, for an additional six minutes, we'll be closed by uh, 15 past four, uh, so that you can be able to exhaust all your questions. Thank you so much for your patience and keep the questions and comments coming in. Natip, how have you been able to handle the staffing situation 
um, you having a very vast uh, network of branches in Kampala and also outside Kampala? Uh, interesting question. We have more than, I think, 150 staff, uh, young, smart people that we love. And um, uh, we frankly do not want to go through this period feeling like uh, we've left one by the roadside. So we want to think that uh, business, like I said, is a force for good, and we need to make sure we are lifting all boards. Um, but also, you find that in um, uh, times of bad uh, macroeconomic periods like this, uh, we need uh, more robust and effective adjustments to deal with uh, uh, stuff like, well, we started with supply chain, but now you're talking about, about human resource. Uh, it talked about uh, finding ways of juggling this uh, situation to ensure that every member of staff uh, gets to work and gets paid. So uh, we all employ people who understand the situation. They are living in the same economy as we do. And, but also there's the legal angle uh, in terms of the Labor Act that you have to uh, take into consideration. So before you think about uh, changing or altering someone's contract, you really need their uh, full agreement. So we tried and uh, sat down with each member of our team and um, discussed hourly adjustments uh, to move with the times because uh, as you know, a lot of our stores are 24 hour stores but now this uh, lockdown period, it means we, we have to close at around five or six. So it means we're basically working a third of the usual work shift. So the need for uh, a 150 man workforce is gonna reduce. Uh, so what you do is then you have to make sure that each uh, individual fills a few hours and then you keep rotating them. But then you run into a problem of public transport. Uh, not being super reliable. So then what you do in that case, if you have a large network of branches like we do and he does and uh, Patrick does, is you move stuff within those branches to branches that are closer to where they live so they can walk. Uh, we are fortunate that some of us got stickers through the Ministry of Health and you can pick up a few of those guys and then bring them to work and you know work it around. But now there's been some easing of restrictions on transport, so we're seeing some sort of um, normal resumption of uh, transportation. So yeah, that's working out a little better, but the hours haven't been extended. So you have to make sure that every one of your staff somehow gets to log certain hours and get something home. Uh, but also, I feel like uh, our government needs to do more on issues of um, trade adjustment assistance. As Guardian, we were fortunate to apply for a few grants from the CDC and uh, it's the investment arm of the UK government. Now I saw some grants from USAID that are geared towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, reducing on the negative impact of COVID, maintaining livelihoods. There's these grants out there that we think we can win and then bring on board and try and uh, smooth and whatever losses we may have taken. So I encourage uh, uh, guys in this business to try and look around and find these grants right. And then, you know, bring in that money and keep uh, people's livelihoods going. It's important mm -hmm. that we are our brother's keeper, we are our sister's keeper, because these guys are the ones that keep our companies looking like uh, uh, very nice companies to, to, to associate with. It's the staff, first and foremost, who keep us tick. So we have to look out for them at all times. It's extremely heartbreaking to see that some pharmacies are folding and with that goes uh, uh, people's employment. Now there's another thing that we haven't talked about in terms of staff. Uh, I told you guys, I think we we're having a conversation yesterday when I said that uh, it, and, and it alluded to it today that he's finding improvement, becoming more efficient, and that may actually mean 
that he's, he realizes he doesn't meet all that workforce that he's been having. He can somehow um, uh, use technology to do certain jobs. So then we as a society, we as guys who care about our staff, we need to think about new sexual training programs that are going to uh, equip our people with skill sets that will make them or keep them competitive post COVID. We talked about telepharmacy, we talked about, um, we talked about telemedicine, we need to think about stuff like that. We need to make sure we're ready to mount uh, a response to what I would call uh, technological unemployment. We're going to have redundance post COVID that is driven by advancements in technology. You know, uh, uh, difficult situations are the mothers of all inventions. So we as business owners are going to think about uh, ways of doing what we were doing pre-COVID with less. Mm -hmm. And that may result in people losing their jobs. So we need to come together and think about equipping these guys with new skill sets that will make sure they remain employed post-COVID. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much Natif for definitely making us look at that angle uh, technology is the future it's here with us covid happened there's a new normal there's a next normal and so i know we can continue with this webinar and the conversation can keep on going on we'll definitely continue this conversation on our social media platforms uh, but at this juncture i'd like to wrap up this session and i'd like to ask the panelists to just give us a parting shot. But even as you give us a parting shot of what recovery looks like post COVID, I want you to touch on what Philip Asimwe says, that he says telepharmacy, telemedicine is the future. And Raphael is asking about what will it take to be regulated for an online pharmacy? So as you're giving your parting shot, please uh, give us an insight to what you actually think in as far as pharmacy and technology is concerned. I'll start with it. It. All right, so we'll start with uh, it. Are you back? Okay, wonderful. It. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I don't think you had your question. Id, you're muted. Okay, so Id, I was asking you to give us your parting shot on to what recovery looks like post-COVID, but even as you're giving us your parting shot, uh, please uh, uh, touch on what Raphael and Philip Asimwe uh, have just um, uh, thrown on the chat room about the future of pharmacy being uh, advanced technology uh, in regards to telepharmacy and telemedicine. It. Okay, so we've lost it. Natif, would you like to go? Yeah, so, um, you know, telepharmacy is the future and uh, I cannot tell you enough um, about the importance of um, thinking in this direction. Technology is the future of business. Uh, COVID has simply accelerated that uh, process, uh, but it was still bound to come. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we've done um, as Guardian and with the support of uh, CD, the CDC group is um, we have engaged uh, the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda to try and think about ways of doing uh, telepharmacy. Uh, we have seen some companies like, uh, I'm sure you guys know about Rocket Health, uh, TMCG, these guys who are making inroads in the, the telemedicine space. Uh, we think that that's also the future of pharmacy. We need to also think about ways of finding our client in their palms. Uh, a lot of Ugandans own uh, smartphones and these uh, amazing tools that we need to fight for. 
we need to fight for shelf space in people's farms. And the only way we do that is by embracing telepharmacy. Guardian has partnered with uh, Jumia to try and uh, uh, ride off of their platform and uh, you know, be their fulfillment partner in certain aspects, especially in Kampala. We hope that long run we'll develop our own tool in partnership with CDC and uh, the Pharma Society of Uganda that we shall pilot in our stores before the close of this year and see how the, the people take it. We believe the society will adopt that and then move on. The, 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 the era of brick and mortar stores is moving, it's shifting. Same way that the likes of Barnes and Noble used to think that, you know, to get a book, all I have to do is walk into their store and pick up the book. Then Amazon came and blew them out of the water previously. It was unthinkable that, you know, I would sit home and order for whatever I want from the comfort of my home. Why not be able to do that, order for my medication from the comfort of my home? So good thing we are seeing is that our regulator, the National Drug Authority, is willing to embrace technology. It's willing to embrace innovation. And unfortunately, the law that governs our practice is a law from the 70s when people didn't even think about smartphones, you understand? So National Drug Authority is willing to embrace this technology and try and drag us out of the 70s into the, you know, <laughs> the new age. And that will mean that we have to have laws that are in tune with the times. And quite frankly, uh, even our government is uh, willing to support these initiatives. COVID mm -hmm. has forced us to think outside the box and uh, I think it's important that we embrace the future and it, it will be good for us. I do not know how good it will be for the worker who is used to just walking into the pharmacy, seeing these patients walk in and then work on them. But as I said earlier, we need to retool the process, we need to retrain them and equip them for the, the changing times. Okay, so you're passing short to the audience. What would you like them to go away with? I'll wait for it shortly. <laughs> All right, so it give us your parting shot as well as just talk about technology and pharmacy very shortly. Starting from the technology part, of course, from, from the processes of drug invention to supply chain and everything, there has always been technology. But we have always been able to adopt technology at the tail end, that is serving the client. And of course, this was on, on, the, on the background that medicines are rather personal. But of course, we have seen so many personal things that can be delivered through technology. Like, so the, the issue of technology, those of us who are quicker than the other, I think, is going to be a, one of the leaders for the pharmacy practice. And uh, let it be at the point of service, let it be at the point of delivering the actual medicine. Instead of somebody to ask a question, they will find information, know which one is their response. I think we'll be embracing technology, and as Natif has said, good enough, our regulator is extremely supportive. And you're right, and the whole country generally is quite supportive. Uh, I think for me, COVID has around for has been a very good opportunity to fine-tune our systems mm -hmm. and robust mm -hmm. and also to think about mm -hmm. even the human resource we have been talking about mm -hmm. frankly speaking it has been a reflection whether we needed 150 has said, just reflect on that mm -hmm. in terms of the budget and in terms of the issues around stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been a good question on perfect.
audience. Any introduction? And, uh, it's very good. For organizing thank you so much it, every every disaster presents an equal scale and upgrade our systems patrick would you like to give us your parting shot yeah, yeah sorry about the, the sorry. issues the technology sorry about that yes so um i'm more than delighted to have been part of uh, uh, this panel I need to say, I need to talk to people who are listening in and they have a dream of starting the business in pharmacy. Nice. The thing is, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. I know our audience is quite diverse. But I'm talking to that person who idolizes it and native. And yourself. <laughs> the secret is getting started. Or maybe, as Natif is saying, if you dream to own a business like Lisa Pharmacy one day, yes, Patrick has built four great branches in four years. But the difference is that. Lisa today was just uh, an idea in my head four years ago. Ha, I remember in Tinder. And yes. The difference is that I got started. So when I look back when I started, maybe someone out there is better positioned to do that. So today we have discussed consumer trends. We have discussed human resource, the supply chain. But all these things, you will only need to know them when you get started. And people forget that collecting information is not all there is to starting a business or owning it. Actually, if you collect a lot of it, if you overanalyze, you get into what we call analysis paralysis, and you will never get started. So basically, what I'm saying, if you think your dream is, uh, is to start a business in pharmacy, please pick yourself up. Let these COVID times not uh, dissuade you from doing it. I think you can go out and get it. So uh, lastly, I want to thank the organizers, Stella and Tim. Uh, it's been a great time. It's been a great event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. The secret to getting ahead is to get started. Start before you're ready. And all these things we are talking about, you'll never know until you get into the gutter. Thank you so much. Uh, one statement from Natif, please, and then we will just wrap this up very quickly. Natif? Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the time um, it's taken to organize this. I know uh, Stella and um, and your team have put in so many hours to try and get this going. Of course, it sucks that uh, we occasionally have technology challenges, but who doesn't? Sometimes the internet just messes you up. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I have to thank uh, our audience, uh, both here on Zoom and um, on the wider social media platforms that uh, uh, PSU has, uh, has going on. I thank my fellow panelists. I know Patrick from uh, our interactions in Tinder and we've become friends. We talk on occasion. I know Ed from way back. We learned the trade from the same guy, uh, Vine, and uh, what that uh, really has taught me is I look at Ed as my big brother. When I have a problem, I run to him. I don't look at him as a competitor. And I really appreciate that. And uh, looking at this COVID period, I think we need to look at uh, fellow businessmen in this, and women, sorry. Uh, we have to you know, uh, but fellow businessmen and businesswomen in this space as equal partners uh, and not as competitors. Because as we've uh, found out rather rudely, 
uh, if the supply chain goes south, we all will not meet our clients' needs and we shall not sleep well at night. So I, I, this idea of resource pooling will only work if we have the mutual respect that the people say on this platform have and uh, we all have the same goals, which is to serve uh, client needs. And I think I need to remind uh, people out there to kind of continue being safe, sanitize, listen to what uh, our health ministry officials and the president advise us to do to keep to stay out of trouble. Uh, we are our brother's keeper, we are our sister's keeper. We need to keep each other safe. And um, yeah, uh, have a good thank time. You. Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Nati, for your words of wisdom. It's all about collaboration and partnership. Collaboration in competition. And so I love the fact that we were able to bring in the giants in the industry to sit down together and actually be able to unearth mutual issues, mutual things that really affect all of us that end up affecting the consumer and how we can be able to mitigate them. I'd like to thank uh, the panelists for definitely taking time to be able to share with us your amazing and valuable insights. I'd like to thank Kennedy in the background or Dr. Nero Kennedy, who has helped us, with, uh, helped us with technology, both on Facebook and on Zoom. And I'd like to thank PSU for hosting us on this webinar. And I'd like to thank the audience for taking time and being with us and giving us your questions. And I hope it has been fruitful and worth your while. God bless you and make you a blessing. We will thrive post-pandemic. We come out stronger than ever. Thank we you. We need you alive, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been, it's been good. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. So welcome.